Hi guys! My name is Miss Emily and I am a children's librarian at the Ashboro Public Library. I wanted to take some time to tell you guys about the awesome book club that we're going to be having once a month at the Ashboro Public Library. So for October, our book is going to be Walls Within Walls by Maureen Sherry. And to help you guys decide if you want to read this book and join us at the Ashboro Public Library on the last Thursday of the month, I'm going to go ahead and read the first three chapters for you. Chapter one. Thump. The Smith Fork kids were sitting on boxes, hanging their legs off the sides and sweating. It was a late August day in Manhattan. The kind of their dad said you can taste when the smells of the city linger in the mouth and nose. It was a day when the heat couldn't seem to find the energy to shove off and go somewhere else. In the window, an air conditioner grumbled fitfully, doing little to cool the bedroom. Thump! Brid lobbed another tennis ball at her stack of boxes. They were moving boxes, all different sizes, with the words Moving magic written on the sides. The kids were supposed to be unpacking, but instead they were seeing who could topple over their stack first. Nine-year-old Brid was determined to win. Her brothers, 12-year-old CJ and six-year-old Patrick were tossing balls at their own stacks and their boxes were tipping just a little bit more than hers. This made Brid anxious. She hated to lose at anything. Patrick let one fly and completely missed, knocking over a plastic robot instead. The robot fell off the desk and onto its side, making a big clatter on the wooden floor. Smash! Their two-year-old little sister, Karen, was napping in the next room. As the oldest, CJ was not about to be held responsible for waking her up early. If you're going to miss so badly, dork, don't bother throwing, CJ said. He pushed his wavy brown hair out of his face. Brid thought about it. Brid thought about answering with something sharp and mean about how CJ had just gotten cut at tryouts for the soccer team at his new school, but she thought better of it and said nothing. There was such a bad mood hanging in the air. Their new home felt strange and everyone was anxious about starting at a new school. Brid knew that antagonizing her older brother would end badly. Brid was a willowy, wiry, blonde girl. She looked like a strong wind could push her over. Inside, she knew she was tough. She just hadn't been tested yet. Moving into this neighborhood was supposed to have been a great thing for the Smith Forks. It was one of the fanciest neighborhoods in Manhattan across the street from Central Park and surrounded by private schools. At least, that was what their parents said. In fact, it was the worst thing that, ever, that had ever happened to CJ. He had a lot of friends in Brooklyn, and he loved his old school. He had pitched for the middle school baseball team, and now he wasn't even on any team. He had given up his wonderful old life for a Fifth Avenue existence he felt only his dad really wanted. I mean it. Keep quiet, CJ said. His voice trailed off. It was Patrick's turn again. He raised his tennis ball and let loose, taking out the top box off of his pile, which was filled with Lego pieces. They tumbled out of the box with a great crash. Even though he was only six, Pat was tall, still in the in-between place where he sometimes looked babyish and sometimes like a real kid. Nice shortstop, said CJ. Rolling his eyes at Pat was all the encouragement Pat needed to lunge at his brother in an almost serious wrestling move. Only one year ago, the Smith Forks were like families in East New York, Brooklyn. They lived in a brownstone house built in 1880 that, except for plumbing and electricity, had not had much done to it since then. Their mom, Anne, loved architectural history, and she couldn't bear to modernize old buildings. To her, adding conveniences to a building meant losing its original character. Think of the family that built this house, she would say. Think how proud they were of this Think how proud they were of this paneled wall, even if it has termites in it. 
she had painted the old oak floors of their Brooklyn house green, and that's how they had stayed, warped and green, the entire time the Smith Forks lived there. Maybe the best thing about their Brooklyn home was that they had a yard. It wasn't much of a yard, so small their mom said she could mow the lawn with her tweezers. Still, it was a piece of the earth that was theirs, and they could go outside whenever they wanted. Now they were Manhattanites. It seemed everyone lived in apartments here, stacked one on top of another just like the moving boxes. Worst of all, their mom was too busy to spend her days with them the way she always had. She was meeting with interior decorators and shopping for furniture, and she had hired Maricel, a stern woman from the Philippines, to be their nanny. Maricel was efficient and professional and used to working with families more structured than their own. Their father wasn't strict at all. Mr. Smithfork used to be poor, and now he was rich. After college, when his friends went to work for investment banks on Wall Street, Bruce Smithfork couldn't pull himself away from games, specifically video games. Not only was he good at playing them, he liked to invent them. He started a company in their Brooklyn basement called Le Cube, and his game, The Pee Wee, was a big seller. Then something happened that changed everything. Bruce Smithfork sent the Pee Wee to one of his friends for his 40th birthday. His friend, who worked on Wall Street, liked it so much, he told Smithfork that his game was better than any game he had ever played, and Mr. Smith and Mr. Smithfork should take his company public. What he meant was for Mr. Smithfork to sell half of the Le Cube company to the public, giving the family a lot of cash and allowing the company to be traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Within weeks, their Brooklyn living room filled with men in suits. They spread long rolls of paper on the scuffed up coffee table and punched numbers into calculators. They drank a lot of coffee. Finally, the day came when the men in suits left and Mr. Smithfork rang the bell at the New York Stock Exchange. The kids couldn't believe it when he came home and said, Hey, we're millionaires. He swung their mom Anne around and they all went out to eat at a diner. They ordered whatever they wanted and didn't take home the leftovers. After that, Bruce Smithfork went to work every day in a Manhattan office and wore a suit. He had real employees, rather than his own kids, to test his games on. He had shareholders who insisted his company grow and make more and more money. Anne Smithfork spent most of her time getting ready to move the family out of Brooklyn. She searched Manhattan for the perfect apartment. She shopped for furniture and curtains and schools for the children. She was rarely around during the day anymore. Still, until moving day, they were all sort of happy. On that day, Brid lost her appetite and Patrick cried. CJ just kept reading books and said little. Together, they watched as every item they owned was boxed and piled into a moving truck and driven away from their house with its tiny fenced-in yard and the security bars on the windows. The day after their stuff left, it showed up again in their new home, a Fifth Avenue apartment on the top floor of a historic building. The apartment had gotten tangled in an inher inheritance battle and remained empty for many years. For the better part of 70 years, it had been sitting silent and abandoned, as if waiting for something to happen. It was a huge space, and even though it had been cleaned, it seemed dusty and old. It had bedrooms for all the kids and their parents, a home office for Mr. Smithfork, high ceilings and mahogany paneling and other fancy woodwork. There were words written on some of the walls in fancy script. Their mom said in the 1920s and 1930s it had belonged to one of the richest families in New York, and there were some rules saying the walls couldn't ever be removed. All this change was too much for the Smithfork family. It made them anxious, and when they got anxious, they fought. After the Lego crash, Brid and CJ pummeled Patrick with tennis balls. Patrick fired back, hitting Brid in the face. Brid lunged at CJ, and they both toppled over onto the floor, slamming into a metal grill that covered the room's heating unit. 
a painful cracking noise came from the wall. The grail had been framed in wood, and when it was hit, the frame splintered all over the place. For one long moment, the three kids held their breath and watched as the grill rocked back and forth. Then it tipped and smashed dramatically downward, clattering onto the rosewood floor. Nice, said Brid to her brothers in the moment when everyone was trying to figure out how much damage there was and how much trouble they, they all would be in. She got off the floor and, with difficulty, lifted the heavy metal grill. Neither brother stood up to help her. As soon as she had the grill back upright, it, it slipped from her fingers and banged on the floor once again. She gasped. What? the boys said together. Brid just pointed. What is that thing? she said, covering her mouth with her hands. Their baby sister started to cry in the room next door. Chapter Two Brid was staring straight into a giant almond-shaped eye. The eye wasn't moving, nor was it blinking. It was simply there, behind the wall of CJ's room, where a radiator should have been. Brid wanted to scream because, really, the eye had been spying on them through the grill. She even thought it had winked concentrating on the fact that her brothers were watching her and she had to act brave in front of them brid put out a shivering hand to touch the eye ah she screamed making contact in a flash of chivalry cj pulled her hand back and examined it for bite marks or amputation while patrick ran from the room as if his pants were on fire waving his hands and screaming there was a pause Cobwebs, Brid said quietly, filling the heavy silence in the air. She grinned. I'm screaming because of cobwebs, she giggled, and CJ couldn't help himself. He joined her. Finally, when both kids had regained their ability to breathe, CJ went back to the grill and touched what now appeared to be a very large and realistic painting, extending far down an inside wall that seemed to be behind the wall on, the, on that side of his bedroom. What in the world? began CJ. Who in the world? Brit answered. They looked at each other, enjoying the moment, and CJ shook his head. Things were getting more interesting in this old apartment, their new home. In the next room, Karen continued bawling, and they could hear Marisol trying to soothe her. Their noise had put an end to nap time. CJ locked the bedroom door while Brid walked over to the eye and touched it again. It's part of a painting, she said. I can see that it goes down a long way, and at the bottom there is some sort of light. She pulled her head back to let CJ look through the narrow space. CJ pulled a flashlight from a box and pointed it downward. There was silence in the apartment, except for the fussy noise coming from their sister. The light is actually, his voice trailed off, the light is on a small hallway or a big shelf. It's coming from the apartment below us. As luck would have it, Maricel banged on the door just then. What's going on in there? She asked. Brit leaned against the grill, forcing it back into place, and quickly swept up the pieces of the shattered wooden frame. CJ swung back the door and looked at Maricel, innocently. Nothing, he said in his sweetest voice, widening his eyes. Maricel was a short, round woman. She and CJ were about the same height, five feet tall. Already CJ knew how to shrink himself down and appear smaller and more deferential when he needed to gain favor with her. Um, really, nothing, CJ said. Maricel's face softened. Watch your sister, she said. I have to make dinner. Maricel put two-year-old Karen on the bare floor with a loud exhale before turning and leaving the room. Karen, her brown hair standing on end, looked relieved to be with her siblings. Patrick picked that moment to tiptoe back into the room, his blue eyes transfixed on the grill. 
the place where the eye was. The older kids could tell that Pat hadn't told Maricel anything about the eye. Patrick just knew about these things. Pat, here's the deal, said CJ. The eye is part of a painting on a big wall behind our wall. There is nothing to be afraid of. There is also a shelf or hall far below us with some kind of light coming from it, but it's nothing to freak out about. Patrick stood there with his eyes wide. He didn't say a word. Patrick, said Brid, we need you to keep quiet about this while we investigate. If Maricel finds out, she'll think she needs to tell mom and dad. They'll either take over the investigation or make us promise to mind our own business. Can we have your word? Patrick nodded. In the past, CJ and Brid would never have included him in a top secret investigation. This was his chance to act big, and so that was what he did. Chapter 3 Oh! Patrick was hanging upside down alongside CJ's bed, his feet sticking up into the air while Brid and CJ each held a leg. His face had turned an unusual hue of purple. Let's get him up, CJ huffed from the strain of Pat's weight. He and Brid hoisted Patrick right side up and helped him, helped him to sit on the bed. Slowly, his breathing calmed down. Cool, he said finally. It was the next morning after breakfast, and Brid and CJ were rehearsing Pat's descent into the space behind the wall. They had been practicing raising and lowering him to make certain they had enough strength to hold on to him. It was CJ's idea to do a test run. Patrick was light and lean for a six-year-old, and the fact that he was on the tall side made him more likely to be able to reach the hallway behind the wall. He acted fearless about his mission. Brid was growing impatient, wanting to try the trick for real. Are you ready, Pat? She asked, flicking her hair out of her eyes. CJ seemed more cautious. Remember, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. Come on, Brid said. There's nothing to this. Stop worrying him. Patrick nodded solemnly. Ready, he said, but inside he was trembling. The opening was very narrow and very dark. He had only agreed to do this to score points with his big brother and sister and show he wasn't a little kid like Karen. The three children stood at the opening of the grill. CJ reached forward and tore off the construction paper Brid had taped over the eye last night to keep herself from imagining it winking at her. Good. The light down there is off, CJ said. That means the people below us aren't around. Now is the time. You're sure you'll have my ankles? asked Patrick. We will, Pat, said Brid. Go ahead. Pat looked straight ahead of him, right into the eye. Why is she crying words? he asked. What do you mean? CJ responded. This lady's face, Pat said. She has these funny words in her tears. Hey, snapped Brid. We don't have time for your delaying tactics. Are you scared? If that's what it is, just say so. I can do this for you too, you know. Shush, said CJ. Patrick, what exactly are you talking about? Nothing, Pat said, embarrassed. It's just the words she has coming out of her eye. I can't read them. He pointed his index finger at the eye. Pat, where do you see words? Because we can't see anything, CJ said. In her tears, Pat said. Patrick had begun to read last year in kindergarten but it wasn't as easy for him as for the other kids. He jumbled things, he forgot letters. His teachers thought he was lazy, but their mom insisted something was different about Patrick. He noticed more than most people. He had a great memory and an unusual way of learning. Their mom always made Pat feel special about himself, even when the school gave her the official word that he was dyslexic. She taught him to speak up when he noticed things other people didn't, even if he was embarrassed to. This was one of those times. 
Though Brid and CJ had shown a flashlight on the eye last night, neither had noticed the fact that the lines around it were filled with tiny letters. To Patrick, they looked like a small stream of tears. To the older kids, they looked like wrinkles. But upon close examination, those were, in fact, tiny words. CJ pulled a magnifying glass from his desk drawer. He thrust a paper and pencil into Brid's hands. It does say something, but I can't read it. Brid, I'll recite the letters to you, and you write them down. Okay, Brid said solemnly. She looked at Pat's face, and his eyes were all twinkly. She felt a twinge of jealousy. Here goes, said CJ. L X O X G space V E N X L space H G space L X O X G space L M K N V M K M X L period. Z Q M space P T M X K space Y K H F space T U H O X space M H space K N I M N K X period. Patrick peered over Brid's shoulder, trying to figure out what the words meant, thinking it was writing that he just couldn't read. What's it say? he asked. It's a secret message, Brid said. Like, maybe a word jumble. CJ was already moving the letters around. He loved puzzles, crime shows on TV, and mystery books. And he knew a lot about clues. I don't think this is a word jumble, but I do think these are words. Look at the erratic spacing. Maybe it's some sort of skip writing he said, thinking out loud. What's that? asked Pat. It's when you take your message and shift a fixed amount of letters, letter spaces in the alphabet to conceal the real message. I don't get it, Patrick said. Brid answered. Say you wanted to write the letter A, and you were doing a one-skip message. Instead, instead of just writing A, you would write a B or one letter further into the alphabet than you mean. The reader needs to know how many letters you shifted in order to get the message. Pat scratched his elbow. Why would someone do that? Why wouldn't they just write an A if they wanted to say A? Because they were trying to hide the message from, from who? Good question. Could be from anyone, CJ said. Or maybe they just like puzzles and jumbles. So should we try and read it first? Asked Pat, secretly relieved to not be heading into the wall just yet. What if it says, danger, keep out? We'd want to know that, right? Nobody answered him. CJ was trying to shift the alphabet one, then two, then three spaces to no avail. Then he tried it backwards, where A equaled Z, B equaled Y, etc. And that didn't work either. Brid was restless. Let's have Pat look around down below. We can figure this code out anytime, but who knows when we'll have another chance to be alone here when the people below have their lights off. CJ looked up from his scribbling to meet Pat's gaze. You don't have to do this, Patrick, he said again. Brid's right, Patrick said bravely. It's time. They all stood in front of the opening in the wall. Brid and CJ each grabbed hold of one of Pat's legs. Ever so gently, they helped him ease himself from a squatting position into a slow motion dive, face forward down into the dark hole. A full 10 seconds passed and Patrick's body started to feel a little heavy to CJ and very heavy to Brid. Finally, they heard, Mahomet. What? Brid inquired. Mahomet. Came out again, while Pat's legs seemed to kick. 
pull, Brid, CJ said. I can't understand him, Brid said. Who cares? Just get him up, said CJ, a hint of panic in his voice. Together, they lifted him up, groaning and straining as he rose to the surface. Patrick banged his face on the edge of the opening. His arms were tucked in front of him, tightly clutching something. CJ helped him back in through the opening and brushed a bit of debris off his face. Pat spat some cobwebs out of his mouth and began sweeping the dirt off the flat thing he was carrying. He had sawdust in his hair, but his big blue eyes were shining with pride. You did it, Pat, said CJ, hugging his brother, surprised both by Patrick's success and his own relief. Brid was more interested in the thing Patrick was carrying. It was a dusty, yellowed book covered with cobwebs. What is that? she said, taking it from his hands and opening the front cover. A piece of paper fell out and fluttered to the floor. The edges of the paper were discolored and slightly torn. Hey, said CJ, noting the spine of the book. This was taken out of the New York Public Library. I wonder if whoever took it out is still getting fined. Brid picked up the paper from the floor, and there, in a large scribble, were the words, Please return. Please return, she said. Guess someone forgot to do their chores way back then. Way back when, exactly, said CJ, looking in the back of the book. See, they had no scanners then. The due dates are all handwritten on a card. This book was due April 29th, 1937. Seems like someone was very naughty and does not deserve their allowance, Brid said in a sing-song voice. Or maybe they thought they could get out of their chores by sticking it on a high shelf where nobody looked, Pat said, thinking this was something he would do. Then CJ said, I'm not sure the kids who lived here really had chores. Those little rooms in the back of the apartment are servants' rooms. They probably had servants, and returning a library book seems like one of those jobs you would have a servant do. Patrick and Brid looked at each other before Brid said, He's right. What's the title of the book? It's Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Great book, CJ said. There are probably a hundred copies of this at the library. They might never have missed it. I wouldn't be too worried about getting it back to them anytime soon. But look at this heavy leather cover, said CJ. Most library books aren't so ornate. It's probably valuable. I mean, it's a pretty early printing. We should probably return it, said Pat. Return it, said Brid. Like, hello, here is our library book, and sorry it took us 73 years to get it back to you. Yes, said CJ but isn't it sort of like stealing when you find something that belongs to someone else if you know how to get it back to them, but you choose not to? No, Brid said, because it's going to look like either we or our ancestors just never got around to returning it. I mean, why bother? I guess I see your point, especially because we'd be giving them back a defaced book, CJ said as he gingerly turned the pages. What do you mean? Someone wrote the words, the seven keys to, right above the title of the book, Treasure Island, said CJ. I don't get it, said Pat. Someone wrote in pen above the title of the book so that it reads all together, the seven keys to Treasure Island. The kids sat in silence, each contemplating what this meant. Hey, CJ, Pat said. Did you try seven skips? What? To break the skip code, you know, from the lady's eye. Did you try skipping seven places? The borrower of the overdue book seems to have liked the number seven. No, not yet. Well, maybe you should, Patrick said. I kind of like the number seven, too. CJ rolled his eyes. Then he glanced again at the text from the painting. Slowly, he skipped seven places for the first word. L-X-O-X-G would become, um, well, seven. Geez, Pat, you're right. Keep going, said Brit impatiently. Keep skipping seven places. Okay, um, 
V E N X L becomes clues. So it says seven clues. What else? Britt insisted. Quickly, CJ went through the other words, scribbling down. Seven clues on seven structures get water from above to rupture. What does that mean? asked Pat. Excellent question, little man, said CJ. Excellent question. Hey guys, said Brid. I think we should do as this little piece of paper says. I think we should return this library book. It's the right thing to do, CJ said. Yes, definitely the right thing to do, said Pat, happy to agree. It's also the only thing I can think to do next, replied Brid, covering up the eye again with construction paper. And that is the end of chapter three of Walls Within Walls. Thank you guys for reading that with me, and I hope you found it as interesting as I did. Our book club for Walls Within Walls by Maureen Cherry will be meeting on October 28th, that's a Thursday, at 4 p.m. We'll meet downstairs in the meeting room directly to your left when you walk when you walk into the Asheboro Public Library and we'll have snacks and maybe even do, do a couple cool activities together. If you want more information about the book club or you want to call to register, go ahead and call 336-318-6804, which is the children's room at the Asheboro Public Library. Bye guys.